Good afternoon. Are they better? One, two. En, to, har I skudder? En, to, tre, fire. Thank you very much. So with that, I can welcome you all to this DTU Ørsted lecture. Both those of you who are watching online, those of you who will be watching the lecture offline at a later stage, and those of you who are present in the auditorium today. The DTU Ørsted Lecture Series runs now for its 24th year. For all these years, uh, we have been able to present interesting research from the podium to DTU students, DTU faculty and guests. And today, uh, we also have a very interesting lecture for us. It has been planned and prepared by the DTU Ørsted board uh, and, a, and a warm thank you to the board uh, for uh, their work uh, in, uh, in this. Today's lecture is renowned, renowned in two areas, surface science and catalysis and water structure and properties. And he is Professor Anders Nilsson from Stockholm University. Professor Anders Nilsson obtained his master's degree in engineering from our sister university uh, in Stockholm, the Royal Institute of Technology, from which he went on to get a PhD degree in physics from the University of Uppsala and since then, he had, has held faculty positions in Uppsala, at Stanford University, and since, two, since 2014, he is a professor at Stockholm University. In surface science and catalysis, Professor Nilsson has pioneered operando techniques where surface phenomena are characterized under realistic conditions. He has developed new instruments at synchrotrons and at free electron X-ray lasers. His work is published in more than 300 scientific papers and cited more than 35,000 times. And for this work, he has received numerous awards and honors 
one of which is a doctor technicist honoris causa degree from DTU in 2015. Professor Nelson held a full professorship in photon science at SLAC, the Stanford Linear Accelerator, but was recruited back to Sweden to Stockholm University in 2014. Now I talked about Professor Nelson's work in surface science and catalysis, but very dear to his heart, I think, is uh, the field of water properties which is also the topic for today's lecture. It's a fascinating story, but I'll let Professor Nilsson tell, tell us about it. After the lecture, there will be the opportunity to ask questions, and you can already uh, start preparing your question now. For the question and answer session, Professor Anker Dein Nielsen, Anker Dein Jensen, from our Department for Chemical Engineering, and a member of the Ørsted Board uh, will uh, coordinate uh, that that session. Anker is sitting here in the first row, and let I'll just say that, uh, and Anker will probably repeat it. We have a microphone, and it's important uh, to speak into the microphone uh, for those uh, who are not here in the auditorium. Once, ag once again, welcome to everybody. Do enjoy the lecture, I'm sure you will. And with this, I'd like to invite Professor Anas Nilsson to the podium. Th <clears throat> Thank you, Rasmus, very much for this very kind uh, introduction. And uh, I will also say, like to say, it's an honor for me and a strong a privilege to actually give this lecture, um, particularly here at DTU, because I think I've been coming to DTU for the last 30 years on many, many occasions, and, and in particular 2015 to, to receive this extra doctorate. Um, it's also a very special day for me because this is the first time I'm visiting another university after the difficult situation we have been through. So this is uh, very special in that way, to be able to come and give lectures again. Um, and it means that we are coming back to maybe something a little bit more normal. Today I will be talking about water. And um, as probably I was 20 years ago when I so suddenly came into water science, I assumed that water being such an important liquid for us, um, going all the way from physics to chemistry, biology, geology, climate change, everything. And I assume everything has to be well understood about water. And I come to understand that is not the case. And uh, I will take you on a little bit of a journey here, first to introduce in what way water is remarkable and strange. Not strange in a mysterious way, in just ordinary properties. And the way water is strange make also our existence possible. Uh, so we are grateful for <laughs> water strangeness that we all can sit here today. Um, oh. So let me go to this first slide, which uh, of course tells you a little bit, a little, a li a little bit about the, the importance of water. And as we can see, our Earth is covered by two-thirds of water. And today, we know a lot about climate change discussions. And actually, the effect of climate change will mostly be seen through water, either too much or too little, all over the planet. The other thing is that a living cell contains actually two-thirds of it is water. So we have two-thirds here in both, so to speak. And uh, as we know, there is no life without water as we know it. And as we are searching in the universe for potential other planets for where it could exist life, we are looking if there could be water. So there is a lot of mystery here about water and life. And I will just, I'm not an expert on life and biological processes, but I will bring in a very a big speculation at the end of this lecture. And you have to take it for that, speculation. 
we have to be brave sometimes. Um, so let's start a little bit to think about some remarkable aspects of water. This is the ocean, and you see an iceberg, and it floats. If you just make a simple experiment that you freeze ethanol ice and you put it in ethanol, it sinks to the bottom. It's not water that is normal, it's actually ethanol. And most other liquids, the solid form is more dense than the liquid. So here you have the number one. Number two, very simple one. I think all of you know that we have a density maximum in water, which means that water becomes heaviest at four degrees Celsius. It's not heaviest here at the top where you have the ice, where you have zero degree water. It's lighter. And it has to do with, of course, that the density as a function of temperature, a normal liquid will, will become more and more dense as the temperature goes down, and water behaves as a normal liquid when it's warm. And then some, somewhere around 50 degrees, it starts to deviate, and then you, you get this maximum. And then as you cool it further, and you will see later that we can really go to a very low temperature of the liquid, water actually expands up on cooling. Very weird. So if you just take these two properties and you think about it, here is the ocean, the coral reefs. If water would have been a simple liquid, ice would have sunken into the ocean. It will be covering the ocean floor of ice during the ice times, and the density maximum allow convection in the ocean, and we will actually have hardly no marine life. We will have a, a very simple chemical liquid uh, covering our planet. And uh, since life, as we, we are mammals, actually came out of the ocean, these two properties actually allow us to exist. So we need to understand where they come from. Another one that is very important here for Northern Europe is the high heat capacity of water, you know, the ability to store heat. And, and we are grateful for that because the Gulf Stream can bring up warm water to... Uh, uh, to our to the northern hemisphere, if water would have been a normal liquid, it would have cooled down on the way up. So, um, living in Sweden, I'm very grateful for this. And also living before in California, I was grateful because we have the Humboldt current that cools off and actually provides air conditioning a little bit in California, giving a very pleasant climate. So actually, a lot of the climate zones, not only, but we also have the jet streams but they are actually affected by the ability for water to store heat or store coldness, so to speak, in, in the ocean. If you go a little bit more into the physics of this, there are three properties that we often call thermodynamic response function in, thermo in statistical mechanics, that's statistical physics. And they are isothermal compressibility. It means that how easy it is to compress a liquid uh, heat capacity, they all mentioned, and the thermal expansion, which is, of course, a derivative of the density, so to speak. And this is related to density fluctuation, entropy fluctuations, and a cross product between entropy and the density. So, as we can see here, the red line corresponds to a typical liquid. And water, when it's warm, behaves as a typical liquid. But then the compressibility goes through a minimum, and it, as you lower the temperature, it gets easier and easier to compress it. It should become stiffer, so to speak. And here you see the same thing, that the heat capacity really takes off upon cooling. It has a m goes through a minimum here at 35 degrees. So already at ambient condition where our, our life is, we already have this de uh, deviation. And, of course, you have here the thermal expansion coefficient where you cross, uh, cross zero at four degrees. It turns out that people ex actually looking at this, uh, Austin Angel uh, in, the, in the 1970s, he has passed away earlier this, this year. He then started to fit this uh, to exponents, and he looked to, to him that there was some sort of liquid catastrophe, something strange would happen at a temperature of 228 Kelvin. I will come back to that later, so to speak. But before that, 
I, let my, I, I like to make a journey into another part of the phase diagram just to demonstrate a, a phenomenon, a principle. And this is the normal water phase diagram. Uh, here you have pressure, here we have temperature. Here is ice, water vapor, and the liquid, so to speak. And of course, here is one atmosphere, and we have the melting point, and here we have the boiling point. It turns out that you can, of course, the boiling point increases as you put more and more pressure on water. And eventually, this phase boundary ends here in what's called a critical point. And beyond that, you have what's called supercritical phase. That is a single phase. There is no difference between the liquid and the gas, so to speak. And if we take just a picture of this as you take a pathway, I will show you this. Here we are in the supercritical phase. And as, as we get approaching closer and closer to the critical point, you start becoming almost black. And it's because the scatter lights now. You have fluctuations on length scale of visible light. And then we go cross passing the critical point into the phase where we have the two phases. And you can see here in forms liquid and gas, so to speak. So we have, above this critical point, we have fluctuations. Uh, the system cannot decide if it wants to be vapor or a liquid phase. And if you take a simulation somewhere out here, you will see that there are pockets of no molecules, and there are other pockets where you have a lot of density of molecules. So this is a, a fluctuating region, so to speak. There was... Um, a concept actually derived very much to someone named Ben Widom. And, and there was an establishment of something called the Widom line. And that is, if you go beyond the critical point into the supercritical phase area, where you have only one phase, it's like you extend the phase coexistence line here uh, into what we call the Widom line. And the Widom line would manifest that if you measure thermodynamic properties like this, compressibility, heat capacity. If you will go towards the critical point, these will diverge into infinity with very well-defined critical exponents. That was, of course, a Nobel Prize to Wilson a number of years for that. Um, but if you would instead cross this window line, you will actually not, uh, the property will not diverge to infinity, but they will reach a maximum value, as you can see here. And the, cl the further away you will get from the critical point, the flatter will that maximum value become. So you already have a clue here that something is diverging here, and it actually may be resembling some of that, that we actually have in our ordinary water, not up at this uh, three or 400 degrees Celsius at ordinary water. So there is a hint that there is something interesting going on here. So here is a picture, actually Nikolai pointed to me once, a beautiful picture I took here from, from Denmark, you know, up in Skagen, uh, where North Sea meets, uh, the I think, uh, the Baltic Sea. And we have a separation of two oceans. Um, could it be that we could have two different liquids of water? both being H2O, and one actually having much higher density than the other one. Could these two liquids then have a critical point in such a way that ordinary water is a supercritical phase? It's not a simple liquid, it's a supercritical phase, which actually will mean that we live in a supercritical water, but not between a liquid and a gas, but between two liquid phases. Very bold idea um, that you would have then the separation of a blue and a red type of liquid that they're colored here. And this goes back to a paper in by uh, Peter Poole, Francesco Scortino, Esman, and Jean Stanley at Boston University. They did simulations, and in these simulations, they found that actually they could see two different liquid phases. Um, a little bit like this, you would have a high density liquid and a low density liquid. And here you have pressure and temperature. Unfortunately, it's the other way around in the other phase diagram that I show you. 
Um, and these will be simple liquids, behave like any other liquids, so to speak. And you will have a phase coexistence line here, uh, where these two will coexist. They will end in a critical point, and beyond that critical point, you will have fluctuations. Um, and our ordinary water will be up here, where we will be in this supercritical phase. It's like, again, water cannot decide if it wants to be uh, high density or low density liquid. This is, was only a hypothesis that would explain then this strange behavior, but there existed actually three or four other hypotheses to expla explain water's behavior. And of course, I'm not going to go, go through those. We will stay with these because there might be some relevance to why we will stay with this. Uh, and my role here has been to develop techniques to experimentally test if this hypothesis would work and if it can explain this strange behavior of water. The challenge why this has never been done before has to do with this figure. That critical point will be lie in rather low temperature and at high pressure, even though it's further away from ambient water, it's still affected uh, ambient water because it generates that supercritical phase, so to speak. So it's important. So here we have temperature, pressure, yellow is our ordinary liquid, and as you can see, as you put pressure on it, the melting point goes down, which actually all the other liquid it goes up, so it's al already another strange property. Orange here is supercooled liquid, and it turns out that it's quite easy to supercool a liquid. You can all do it at home. Uh, just cool the water a little bit in your freezer. You can get deeper and deeper into supercooling by having a smaller, smaller volume, and the water has to be very pure, no dust particle. Yes so it's that there can be no nucleation event. Then you can come down to this dotted line here, which is often called the homogeneous ice nucleation line. It's when the pure water still will freeze, so to speak. It's not a thermodynamic line, it's a kinetic phenomenon where, it's where the rate goes up very much. If you come here below, it turns out that you can actually generate two different amorphous solid of ice called low density amorphous ice and high density amorphous ice and they have been shown to actually be a glass a glass is that you can cool a liquid down and it's it's dynamic becomes extremely slow and you get arrested so to speak uh, that's a glass <coughs> and again you have a dotted line here as well so if you go above that one it will freeze. And this has been denoted, this uh, region here, for no man's land, um, just like this would be trenches in the First World War, so, World War, so to speak, and uh, you couldn't go in there because you will be not shot at, but you will freeze <laughs> very rapidly. And that's why nobody could investigate this region, and nobody could see if there is two liquids, if there is a critical point, or any sign of any of that. Because this 228 Kelvin, where it was diverging towards, is actually below here, so to speak. So, the first experiment is to generate this high density amorphous ice. And this is taken just from a, a simulation from Nicolas uh, Giavan Battista. And here you just put pressure on hexagonal ice, as you can see here, and it actually transforms into a very compact amorphous solid that you then can generate it into a glass. And, and we will now start to use X-ray techniques to look into the structure of these type of materials. And some of you are very well, you know, know very well about X-ray techniques and others less, so we will come in with X-rays <coughs> and then we will scatter to the sample and, and with this angle, we call that eventually a momentum transfer, and we will see a ring. We will not see dots as Bragg reflection from a crystalline material, but the ring when it's a disordered material. And you will see this then in what we call reciprocal space, and we call this the structure factor. So it's a one over Ångström. And we can convert this uh, to real space, uh, by using what we call the Fourier transform. It's like going from reciprocal space to real space. 
Um, with X-ray techniques, we can very well measure in reciprocal space. And we will actually look at that. Um, and we will then look at these two different types of material, high density or low density. And I will s soon define actually what is the precise difference between these two, as you will see. So here's the structure factor difference in reciprocal space and in real space between high density and low density amorphous size. And in particularly, we see these two features here in reciprocal space, which corresponds very much related to the second shell in the, what we call the pair correlation function. The pair correlation function corresponds to when we have a water molecule here in the middle and we go out to different distances um, and we're looking at the probability to find another molecule. So as you go here and you see this first peak here, it corresponds to the first shell. And this is actually around 2.8 angstrom, corresponds to the distance between water molecules in the hydrogen bonding network. And here we have this second shell, which is very prominent for the low density amorphous size. And that is exactly when you have this tetrahedral type of coordination where each water molecule can bond to four other like this. And it generates a very well-defined angle in this arrangement. And that is what is seen in this low density amorphous size. And it's also typically seen in normal frozen hexagonal ice, so to speak. When we instead have this high density amorphous, we have actually moved molecule and crossed the system and then moved them here in between the first and the second shell. And that is actually creating the high density. We have more molecules closer uh, to each other in that phase. But what is important for you to remember is that how we convert this to reciprocal space and that we can see these two distinct features separating high and low density. And we are going to convert this now in a very simple way, going from high density amorphous size to low density amorphous size, just, just around this boundary. And you can see very nice conversion. One, one feature here in the reciprocal space convert to the other one. And you can even have coexistence in red where both are seen. And this is a typical evidence of a phase transition. One phase goes to the other phase, a phase transition. You can actually see this if you take this high density amorphous size, put it out, and then from being cooled down and it warms up, and it now converts to the low density. We call this popcorn effect. And, and the reason why it sort of comes out in popcorn here is because you go into the low density, it, it actually takes up more volume, so it expands like that. Question is, would such a transformation also exist at this higher temperature, still in this Newman's land? Can we actually test if the two different liquid states exist, where we have a low viscosity of it? And we have to then do experiments in this region. And we can do that by using tools that I had the pleasure to be at the laboratory that I was developed. And here's a picture of the first X-ray laser in the world, which is actually called li the Lina Coherent Light Source outside Stanford, uh, Stanford University at the laboratory SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory, where I was located before. Um, it's actually uh, installed in the longest building in the world. It's actually a 50-year-old accelerator that was converted into that X-ray laser. Um, what is the difference? Many of you have probably heard about synchrotron radiation over the years, and we have one very nice source coming up, or actually came up al already five years ago, Max 4 in Lund. And typically, um, synchrotron radiation is generating a lot of small X-ray pulses coming out. Um, there might be small energy in the nanojoule per, uh, per pulse, and they are separated uh, with nanosecond between them, and they uh, might be have a width of 50 to 100 picoseconds. The next ray laser instead has a very few pulses, 
and they have megajoule per pulse instead, an enormous intensity, and they are only femtosecond, where femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 second, a very, very short pulses, um, so enormous intensity. Here we are more measuring on the sample, here we are shooting on the sample with shots coming up, and they are separated here very, very long time scale. The experiment I will show you now that we did for this particular investigation was done in Korea. They also have an X-ray laser, and there is a new X-ray laser in Hamburg. Um, some of you, are, I think, are probably involved with that research. So this is actually from uh, at Pohang called the PAL FEL. And what we are going to do is that we are going to bring this sample up now, where we have frozen the high-density amorphous We are generating samples in Stockholm uh, under pressure and quench it down to liquid nitrogen. And then we can take the sample out because it's frozen. We keep it at liquid nitrogen and it can't relax because the pressure is no longer is, is at one atmosphere. So you have frozen in the pressure inside the sample. And then we very quickly will heat this up into this pocket here and then the sample is realizing that it's at one atmosphere and it says, oh, I need to expand. I'm no longer at this pressure. And as, as it expands, we will probe all these different pressures on the way, the room pressure. And then we can see, do we cross a phase transition between two different liquid states? And here is a little sketch of the experiment. I will turn this around here, you can see. The sample sits inside these hexagonal holes and we will come in with an infrared laser to heat it up. And the infrared laser is maybe a trillions of a second short in time. And then we will can come in with an X-ray laser and look how the structure look like. And we will put that scattering onto a detector. Um, as you can see here is a ring and this is an indication of the structure of the liquid. The distance from the radius out to this ring gives you the, in this reciprocal space um, which phase we are in. And this is clearly a high density liquid phase we are, or actually high density amorphous ice uh, if you haven't heated it yet. The question is, what is going to happen now uh, as we are first coming in with, the, with this infrared laser, the sample will start to expand, as, as you can see here, as we heat it up. And then we can come in with the different X-ray pulses, and we can then look, do we, will we see one ring like this? And if that ring, after we heat it up, is just changing its position a little bit, will it indicate that we only have one liquid phase that expands, so to speak? If we see a lot of dots on the screen here, that will be indication that there are no liquid phases up there, there are only eyes. We are crystallizing the sample very, very quickly. If we, on the other hand, will see two rings, it means that we have two different liquid phases present here. So we will then come in first with the infrared pulse and then at the different times with the X-ray pulse. So the first pulse that came after 10 nanoseconds after heated up shows only one ring representative of the high density liquid. If we come in a little bit later, in this case 100 nanoseconds, we can see that pulse being broad and something is coming in here after it. And after one microsecond you can see the second ring being developed. So here is a direct image on the detector of the two liquid phases. You can see it directly. And this was actually quite an exciting experiment. You sit in a control room and you can see the results of the experiment in real time. You don't need to analyze a lot. Of course, you will analyze, go through calculations. You see it directly what actually is. And we can, of course, now look at that in reciprocal space. Here we have the high density. It's a negative delay, means that we haven't yet put in the infrared laser. And as we are instead pumping the system, we can see how the second one comes in, grows, and eventually they are the same amount of the two different liquid phases. And eventually you start to see a little bit sharpness here after three microseconds. 
And if you go longer and longer, you can see then how ice is being formed. But we succeeded to capture the two liquids before ice actually was formed. And we could analyze the data and make a plot here on the logarithmic with time scales and uh, population. And of course, first we only have the high density liquid. And as we go along with time, the low density liquid comes up. And eventually, that one disappears because we are crystallizing out of that low density liquid. So we have the evidence that we have separated out the time scale for the seeing the, the liquid to liquid transformation from the crystallization. And this was very important because there were a number of theoreticians um, claiming that this crystallization will be much faster than you can actually observe, or secondly, uh, that, that, that the second liquid phase will never exist. So it was the direct experimental evidence or testing the two, two different liquids hypothesis. So if we could think that we could hold these two liquid, which we can't because it will freeze, but if we will hold them in a glass like this, they would separate as two different liquids both being only H2O molecules. So that is quite strange. Now, as I shall demonstrate, we have been able to come from this direction and we have seen there are these two different liquid phases. Question is now, can we actually look, look also to see evidence, maybe not of the critical point because it's infinitely small, although we have been time to look for that in November, but the pandemic is preventing us to go to Korea right now. Uh, but can we see any other evidence that do we have only one phase here as we go down? Can we see evidence for this widom line? And we do that by now cooling water very, very rapidly down from hot at one atmosphere. And we are doing it by injecting uh, water droplets into vacuum. And they, then they cool extremely rapidly by what we call evaporative cooling. As they are evaporating into the liquid, they cool uh, the droplets down. And here you can see a plot of estimated temperature of such a droplet as with travel time in milliseconds here. And you can see how fast it cools. And this is a little bit points where we could experimentally probe the liquid. And we can now go to this 228 Kelvin minus uh, 45 degrees Celsius, and really look what, uh, if, if, if we are seeing what it is diverging to. I show you on this momentum here in, in the momentum space, so to speak, uh, when we have the two different liquid phases that one peaks goes down and the other one grows up. It's a discontinuity this continuity in, in this transformation, which is the signature of a phase transition. If we do the same by cooling down at one atmosphere, here's again the same scale of the structure factor. This is just continuously shifting, which means that we don't have a phase transition. It's just a phase that is continuously changing its structure. And if you look how the position of this as a function of temperature here, plotted, and you take instead the derivative of that position as a function of temperature, you will see that it goes through a maximum, and that the maximum is at 229 Kelvin, that mysterious temperature. So that means that the liquid is changing its fastest at that temperature. The structure is changing the fastest at that temperature. So as we cool down, we only have one phase. The next question, do we have a signature of what's called this widom line? And that means that we will see a maximum in the thermodynamic response function, which could be compressibility or heat capacity, for instance. And then you might wonder, can we measure compressibility and heat capacity with x-rays using the x-ray laser? And we can, if we develop some tricks. Turns out that small angle x-ray scattering, where we have a very small change in momentum space, so to speak, in the scattering process. Since in reciprocal space, a small momentum transfer would correspond in real space as a long distance. You can actually detect 
if there are density in homogeneity in the sample on a certain length scale. And if you start to look at the values when this momentum transfer is very, very small, goes towards zero, it means that you're looking at it at infinite long length scale. And that corresponds then to the maximum, to actually um, macroscopic values of fluctuation in the system, and that becomes the compressibility, the isothermal compressibility, which is density fluctuation. So we can actually test that by measuring the small angle. This was an experiment we did more than 10 years ago, going down to 252 Kelvin. You see how that here at very low momentum transfer, you have the increase, it goes up. And we can convert that uh, into this momentum transfer zero, and we can use this thermodynamic relationship here uh, that we can determine the compressibility. And then it turns out that these measurements, which are the squares or the, the circles, match perfectly the macroscopic measurement of compressibility. And this is, of course, exactly what we see. This change here going up is exactly what I show you in early in the presentation when I, when I introduced this strange divergence of the compressibility. We can do th that measurement now with the X-ray laser. You can see here is the small momentum transfer read and the small angle X-ray scattering. I've been talking about this wide angle uh, scattering peaks before that we used to look at the liquid-liquid transition or that the, it was continuous at one atmosphere as we cool it down. This is a very tiny signal. It took us 10 years to be actually be able to measure this with many, many different attempts to make it quantitative here with this X-ray laser. And here is the region of that. Let me just see it, show you how that small angular X-ray scattering signal goes. As we cool the liquid down here towards 227.7 Kelvin, the signal goes up, 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 and then it turns, down, turns around. So what you can see is that the lowest temperature is not the highest value. And you, if you integrate that intensity, you will see that it goes up and then through a maximum and then it comes down again. And we can then use this thermodynamic value and determine the compressibility. And we see your maximum. And the maximum is the evidence of this widom line, so to speak. We have done, I'm not going through that, we have done a number of other experiments. We've also done heat capacity measurements using the X-ray laser. We develop an ultra-fast calorimetry technique with X-ray. We can see a maximum in the heat capacity and also in correlation lengths and the derivative of the structure factor that I showed you before. So we have four evidence here of this widom line. So what does that bring me to? is that we are confirming this hypothesis that we have temperature, pressure. We have come from this side with changing the pressure and we are then throwing it decompresses when it expands in from being in high pressure expands towards room pressure. We have seen a liquid liquid transition. I call it a smoke from a fire somewhere. We are show that as we come instead at one atmosphere, there is no liquid-liquid transition. It's just a continuous transformation. But we have seen the maximum here of the Widom line, which is another smoke. So we have smoke from two, two sides, and there needs to be a fire somewhere, which is the critical point. And that, of course, means that we have we are in supercritical conditions in our ordinary water. And we have made just a little sketch here to, for you to and see the consequence of that to understand the density maximum. Why do we have a density maximum? How that relates to these fluctuating blue and red regions. So here we go. The red is this high density liquid it's moving fast at, at high temperature. It takes up more space for that. As you cool it down, the, the molecules in the glass sink. 
And then at around 50 degrees, you started to get blue molecule that takes up more space, and the sinking of the glass stops. And at four degrees, they are equally balanced. And as we go below, below four degrees, we get more and more blue molecules, and they are taking up more and more space, the blue being low density. And as you supercool it, you even go up further and further. So we can actually very simply understand the appearance of a density maximum. And you can already get the hint why ice floats, because at room temperature, most of the molecules are high density, whereas ice has a structure that more resembles low density. And that's why actually ice floats. So let me come here a little bit to the end. And I will now start to bring in also more speculation. So you have to take it for that. I'm very speculative now. So don't take me for granted. Um, what I've told you with the analogy in the beginning that we are actually living in supercritical water. We are not living in simple water like acetone, or ethanol, or anything. We are living in supercritical water where it fluctuates on a certain length scales. And you can see a little bit this indication of this fluctuation, which is a cartoon. Where we live and region for life is within this region where it's supercritical. I can say, tell you that the boundary is roughly, as you cool water down, is roughly around 50 degrees when it starts to become supercritical. Here's a little simulation just to twit for as a teaser. So here you can see now fluctuations of blue in this red, red molecules. And you can think about it as random, but if we put in a biomolecule, um, maybe these fluctuations are no longer random. Um, we know a lot of people are studying these days a lot of the water molecule around the protein. It's called the first hydration layer. That's where we have a lot of studies, a lot of understanding. Could these fluctuations somehow affect biomolecules through the water on longer distances? Is this part of the magic for life? That's a speculation, actually, from me. And yet, we don't have the real tools for it to probe the molecular structure. We had a little discussion this morning about this, that there are some experiments that try to see the effect of water on biomolecules on long distances. Of course, now the distance is rather close. Here is just as a cartoon but it could be also in the interior of, of, this, of a cell. And I have had some discussion with people at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, and they are telling me about a lot of still mis not yet understood aspects uh, in, a, in, in a cell. And um, there seemed to be a very rapid communication that different parts of the cell knows what the other one is doing. Of course, that can be through many different type of molecules involved, but the water can actually play a role. And is that also why uh, life is so connected to water? So I put up such a very, very speculative slide here, emphasizing that. Um, the DNA provides the, the blueprint for the construction of the components of the cell, the synthesis of the proteins, enzymes, uh, for many of the components. Almost like we have a hardware on a computer, so to speak. It's then the water fluctuation in the water. That means that we are, we are creating dynamics together with the biomolecules, of course. Is that what actually makes the cell then to become dynamics? Allows for the fast communication in the cell. And maybe that is actually almost like become making a software for the computer. And that makes the cell to be uh, become alive. A big speculation. Uh, we still have no techniques experimentally to test this hypothesis directly, how water can behave on long distances. There are some experiments recently in Lausanne by Sylvie Roque, where she has used some nonlinear laser techniques, and she has seen that small amount of ions in water seem to be affecting millions of water molecules around it at very low concentration. So there seems to be something affecting on long distances. 
And can these fluctuations of water being a supercritical phase at our conditions play an important role here? And this is, of course, the future area. And does that make that water and life is deeply interconnected? And as we know, we all came from water, actually. So I'd like to end my talk by acknowledging uh, the number of uh, people here involved in this work. To do this experiment at the X-ray lasers requires a, a large team of work uh, because everybody has to have a different speciality. These experiments are very, very um, difficult, I would say. To do this experiment, where I show you the transformation between two liquids, we had we met for two years every two weeks a group of six people in my office to develop all the details for the experiment. So, so I like to acknowledge uh, King Wan here. Uh, he is now a professor, uh, assistant professor at, in Korea. Katrina Manwinkel, who really developed a lot of the sample. Fivos Parakis, who is now an assistant professor in Stockholm. And, and a number of people here. And I should also give some acknowledgement to people at Swissfell, because that's where we measure the heat capacity as well. So I think that was my last slides. And thank you very much for your attention. And, and I, I would be very happy to take questions. Inspiring talk. So the floor is open for questions. Who wants to go first? We have a question here. And speak into the microphone, please. Yes. Yes. Uh, I have two questions. One specific for this res response function as a function of temperature with respect to the window line. Window line. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the, I saw that uh, you, you already mentioned that this response function is not divergent uh, for the, around this wind and line. Do you, do you know the reason why it is not? Is it because it's not first order phase transition or do you think it is not measured in, it, it is measured in a finite size system? Yeah, I mean, <coughs> it is diverging to infinity at the critical point. Mm -hmm. That is where it's well defined, so to speak. So it's, you can think about it almost like it's diverting at the critical point because you can have the fluctuation of all length scales, all from microscopic to microscopic. And, and, and the reason, as, as, you, as I show you, when we approach the critical point, that picture of, of uh, uh, the, supercrit the critical point between the liquid and vapor became black. Actually, I've looked into myself in an outer cloud, the critical point, or close to the critical point, it looks like milk, actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, because it, you have regions that are mighty, might actually become even micron in size. So when you are instead not at the critical point, when you are uh, along that Widom line, um, the fluctuations are long, uh, no longer on all length scales. They are restricted in length scales. Okay. Uh, and that's why it doesn't diverge. We can see the fluctuations, as you could see the critical point becoming milky because it was such a big length scale compared to, comparable to visible light. But we can see it using x-rays where the wavelength is shorter. But it's not diverging because of smaller size ranges. Mm -hmm. OK, the second question is kind of general. Uh, I saw this kind of water and this kind of merriment. Uh, do you think and it is promising to also do this kind of merriment on the surface in the operational conditions that have some absorbate on it as a function of temperature and pressure? I mean, of course. And is it very difficult, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if bulk water has been difficult to measure up to yes. now, mm -hmm. you can imagine how a few molecules thick surface would be. So I think uh, that's even more challenging to do experiment. Of course, this that water is supercritical, it can also affect many things happening at interfaces. Um, I know here there is a lot of activity in, at DTU in electrochemistry, electrocatalysis. We don't know if 
there are certain things a little bit further away from an interface where this fluctuation can play a role. Um, but that's a, a very open question, how then the presence of a surface, just like a biomolecule, how that can also affect these fluctuations. But uh, very challenging. Maybe you can do the measurement. Yeah, the, the point <laughs> uh, why I ask this question is uh, I'm a theorist, and yeah. during my PhD, we develop an ab initial method yeah. which can measure this kind of ab initial phase boundary and critical point, yeah. even triple point, yeah. use this response function. Then I wonder if there are uh, experiment who can measure this kind of. This is surface in contact with gas. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm looking not, for this kind of work, but I didn't find. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think there is currently anyone who can measure it, but uh, as time progresses, I'm sure there will be more uh, techniques developed that you can actually do the measurements. Yeah. Great. Looking forward. Anyone else? Klaus, over here. Um, as far as I understood, you had a, a good idea of the density difference at the, for the ices. So if I imagine going to ambient temperature, and I think that I have these two density different liquids, what would be the density difference? So uh, let's take this picture. We discussed this a little bit this morning uh, in, in the meeting. So uh, the density difference between these two liquids, when they are pure, is roughly 20%, because they ma match very well the, the glass state down there. But as you're going on this axis where you vary the pressure, of course, then, as you would pressurize any material, the density would vary, of course. And I estimated a big guess, the structure of the high-density liquid region here, which is red, so to speak, um, would have expanded quite a bit. So my guess, it's probably around 1.03 1 in density, something like this, if this is 1.2. So the density difference at one bar pressure will be smaller than the density difference here. Did that answer your question? Well, but you, I, as far as I can see, you're still comparing across the line of minus 45 degrees. I was thinking. Yeah, I was thinking more up here. So oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, more more room room temperature, and and we, I also think that this high density liquid actually will expand because the high density liquid I didn't go into. It's more entropic. It's very much much more flexible in the, in its dynamic and its motion, and therefore it will be more affected by by temperature. Yes, over here. You will get the, the microphone just a second. That's a big microphone. Great. Hey, <laughs> uh, Andy Visser, I'm from uh, DG Wakwa. Uh, I'm, I very much appreciate your uh, speculation on uh, the role of this in life, because that's what we do. Uh, and uh, especially the idea that uh, small amounts of ions could change the properties of water, especially in a cell. And I'm struggling with a question about no, yeah? Uh, I'm, question, I'm struggling with, this, with, a, with a question about the sinking of very small cells in the ocean. Uh, and uh, they apparently can do, they can change their density very, very rapidly on the order of microseconds without apparently changing their volume or without changing, exchanging mass. And so I, I'm very much interested in this sort of, uh, you know, idea that perhaps they can manipulate their internal density due to some sort of iron pump or something. Is that something that uh, you could uh, comment on? <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's very far away from what, what I can um, know about. But I think there is a lot of um, a strange thing that, that uh, can uh, be involved with water, if I, if I can say that. I, I can't comment specifically on what you mentioned there, even though I'm also a very devoted diver and, and I like to spend time in the ocean. Um, uh, so. Yes, absolutely. There are species and organisms can can do certain things with water. Uh, we don't know. Yeah. I, I would say that. Yeah. Thank you. Further questions? We have one down here. 
questões. Thank you, Anders, for a very fascinating talk. Do you think the very large density difference that you see, the 20%, is that due to the specific, you could say, angular orientation and the strong hydrogen bonding in water, or would you see something similar in, uh, in other liquids? Uh, <coughs> water is very special because its ability to form four hydrogen bonds. Mm. Um, there are ideas, suggestions, that another liquid that could behave like this is silicon, a silicon liquid. Um, nobody has really measured that properly. Uh, and of course, the silicon has also four arms. So you could actually have a high density and a low density liquid of silicon. Um, maybe less ex exciting for us because that will be a thousand degrees or something. This is, of course, more essential for us. And also silicate, uh, you know, sil sil um, silicon uh, dioxide could also behave, but they're similar with four arms. And um, there are also two liquid phases of phosphorus, sulfur, but not like this. Um, um, so there might be more and more you know, discoveries of, of these two uh, liquids, two liquid systems. Um, so far as nobody has shown that there exists a critical point. This is the closest to evidence of a critical point between two liquids. Yes. <laughs> One more. That's yes. very much related to this. Can you say something more? I guess there's somewhat different molecular structures in the two phases, the low density and yeah. the high density. I mean, you see a lot of clusters via hydrogen bonding and you see rings and so. Do you know anything about the difference of the molecular structures in the two yeah. different phases? Yeah, it, it's also, so I try to allude to that a little bit, what I call this motion of an interstitial molecule between the first and the second shell of the, of the, of the uh, let me go back a little bit here. Uh, so we can maybe go back to <coughs> a lot of slides. Here. Yeah. So in the low density liquid, which is similar to ice, you have this first shell and the second shell. And the second shell is very much this um, 4.5 correlation between the, the second nearest neighbor, so to speak. So for the high density, you start to fill out a little bit these voids. It's almost like another water molecule can come in here. Um, maybe to put that a little bit in another context would be that um, in water, if you take any solid, let's say a, a metal even, a face-centered metal, it has 12 nearest neighbors. So would also an argon liquid uh, have 12 nearest neighbor. So that's more high uh, packing ice or low density has only four. So that opens a lot of space. And, and the reason for these four, we can see that here, is the directionality of the hydrogen bonds. That is very directional here, yeah. so to speak. Of course, in water, there are also the more isotropic interaction, which we think about dispersion of van der Waals interaction, more, also exist. So you could think about it a little bit like the low density is more governed by this directionality of the hydrogen bomb, but the high density starts to pick up a little bit more of the dispersion, the more isotropic interaction. So you can move in other water molecule, not 12 nearest neighbor, but maybe going from four to five and six. But the extra molecule will be at a little bit longer distance than what you have the nearest neighbor here, so to speak. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do you see any possibility in extending this uh, state of the critical state to be able to probe this with neutrons because neutron pair distribution function analysis would be would give an answer also for the hydrogen oxygen distances but yeah i understand the advantage of the of the laser is that you have these uh, very small time scales yeah i mean the, the neutrons uh, you can maybe let's see if we can go back to one of these phase diagrams somewhere the neutrons can allow you to be uh, measuring here in the yellow region. 
It's difficult even to go to supercool neutrons because the sample volume has to be very small to avoid freezing. And there, as you know, if you're neutrons, I guess you're a neutron scientist, um, it's, 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 um, it's difficult, so to speak. And of course, neutron scattering, uh, you can derive the OH correlation, but that's not always that trivial either because you actually have to do all sorts of simulation to derive these. So um, it's a little bit tricky, I would say, there. Um, the advanced, I was actually at a meeting with um, neutron scientists at Oak Ridge to discuss how they could measure supercooled water on this, and we couldn't come up in a way because neutron cannot do any experiment on short time scales and also needs large volume of sample. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's good in the, in the yellow region here. Yes. So a little bit on that and the structure. So uh, would this uh, transition and density be larger in uh, with different isotopes or 18 neutron? How does this diagram look for heavy water? Yeah, I mean, um, yes. So I can tell you that if you will have D2O, you will have a shift of this Widom line of five degrees. We measure that, so we've done it also with D2O. And I believe also we have evidence that the critical point actually will move further away. Um, so there are some aspects of this, um, where these anomalous fluctuations uh, might be more enhanced in H2O than D2, at least at these lower temperatures, which alludes to that it's actually important to include in many of these, at least from a theoretical point of view, nuclear quantum effect. And um, I talked with some of you about that, that what we mean in nuclear quantum effect is that, um, if do we have a molecule here somewhere? Uh, we had a molecule here, yeah. You have this, <coughs> you have this OH bond, of course, this looks like to be in the stick ball model to be fixed. But as we know, they are vibrating, but it's actually also a quantum mechanical description of that OH bond distribution. And, and how, how that wave function of the probability, let's say, to, to put the hydrogen at different distances uh, will affect the hydrogen bond strength. And, and the nuclear quantum effects actually are a contributor for, for the some aspect to ma actually make the hydrogen bonds a little bit stronger when it's directional. At the same time, it also is a nuclear quantum effect in the, what we call a libration mode when the molecule is swimming around, uh, sw swinging around, so to speak, uh, that actually is a little bit breaking up the hydrogen bonding network. So you have these two counteracting. Um, so this is still, I would say, an early stage to understand how it will affect this phase diagram in detail. But I, th I believe it's very important for theoretical, proper theoretical modeling of water, because still the modeling with the molecular dynamic simulations uh, cannot put the critical point and, 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 and this aspect in the right p position quantitatively. Uh, and the nuclear quantum effect will be very important for that. It's my own belief, so to speak. Yeah. We have more questions, but I know we also have to leave the room shortly. I think, I think let's take the last question here. And uh, yes, so please, Nikolai. Thank you. And as your speculation slide about water and life and DNA being the making the proteins, making the hardware, water being the, the software. As a molecular biologist, I would like to program the cell. So how do, how do you see that we can modify that software in the future? Is that a possibility? Absolutely. I mean, uh, this is a sp speculation, and, and uh, answer that question, I have to speculate more. <laughs> uh, going even to into deeper water. Um, <laughs> uh, so don't hold me accountable for that. <laughs> um, but uh, of course, that's absolutely possible. That would be possible if this speculation is correct. Right? So we don't know how other foreign substance might affect the speculation or other type of radiation, whatever, can, can do. Yeah. 
and I I would often often call that um, in in the U.S. we have courses. I would call we had a water po 1.0 understanding. We are maybe maybe now getting to water 2.0. There is a water 3.0. We don't know yet, and 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 that's for the next generation to tackle. Thank you very much, Anas, for the inspiring talk and the good QA session here. Let's thank uh, Anas once again. Thank you very much. <laughs>